welcome, Andy. So also for those of us who are joining, um, we're doing American Sign Language interpreting. So that will be happening. If that is, um, you know, hopefully that is useful and a joy to you. Oh, Miss Vicious is another one of my Instagram friends. So it's good to see you. New Jersey, our friends from Chile here. Oakland. Henderson, Nevada. There's an, mostly so far it's an American crowd. Okay, BC, we have Canada. Australia, cool, all right. You are not from Antarctica. <laughs> Denver, upstate New York. Oh my God, sign language puppy. Hawaii, more Canada. I'm really hoping that we get a um, San Jose, Trinidad, awesome. Just give it another moment. People may be still rolling in. <clears throat> See if we can get to 150. Oh, people are from Mount Tam. Mount Tam. Mount Tamalpais is sort of, it's what we sort of name the organization after. It's kind of like, you know, the, the sacred mountain of Marin County. Oh, okay. You know, I've sort of always had that kind of archetypal image of, you know, ascend, ascending, receiving yeah. the sacred knowledge, coming back down, or even okay. circumambulating the mountain. Mount Tam, Mount Tam Summit. I like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it looks like if you're looking west. Oh. Okay. So that would be sunset, and that's the bay. The water that you're seeing is is the San Francisco Bay, and then the mountain, and then the sun setting to the west. Beautiful. All right. So, thank you all for coming to close out our evening. Um, really glad that you're here. Grateful for those of you who made it the entire day. And those of you who are just joining, welcome uh, uh, with open arms and open hearts. I'm very honored and grateful to be able to introduce uh, our uh, final speaker for the evening, um, Ayana Ee. Um, Ayana is the wife of the late great Kalindi Ii, a Detroit native, and has realized that her journey as a high crone warrior priestess is a journey of wisdom, understanding, and truth. As a visionary in her community throughout the U.S. and Europe, she inspires women to clear, reclaim their birthright as goddess warriors and divine mothers. Through counsel, tarot, and entheogenic ceremony, but, mostly, but most importantly by divine example. Ayana works effortlessly to provide spiritual guidance for all her sisters and daughters by showing that total acceptance of love and knowledge of self is her code. Profundity, intelligence, silence, and truth allows one to stand in their truth. Ayana E is a modern day witch with ancient sensibilities and 
many testify to that fullness, depth, and passion that Ayana brings to the psychedelic community. Welcome. Deep, deep bows and pranams. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And thank you for having me. Greetings, everyone. And peace and magical blessings to you all. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Mount Tam Summit and, of course, Daniel for uh, including me in such a, with so many great presenters. So I'm very honored at this time to um, speak with you guys. So at that, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to jump right in. First, I want to just say that I'm not going to speak to you this evening about anything scientific, okay? Um, I don't have letters behind my name. I will just share with you a few things of my trade um, and my experiences as a psychonaut. I've uh, been taking um, entheogens for about 20 years now. And um, my entheogen of choice is psilocybin cubensis. Now, I've, you know, I've uh, had the ayahuasca and I've had the toad medicine, but I do prefer the mushrooms. So now that I have something to, the, to compare them to, each is totally different inside of itself but I do prefer the mushrooms. Um, they just seem to talk to me a little bit more. Um, my talk will cover this evening uh, witchcraft uh, as it relates to psychedelics. It will cover death and dying as it re relates to psychedelics and of course sex, um, sacred sex as a part of that journey and experience. So I want to start this evening, um, this first talk about uh, the witchcraft, because I do identify as a witch. And generally, when I open up my lectures, I say that I am the great, 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 great granddaughter of the witches they didn't burn. But when I mentioned that to Daniel, he said something that gave me a very thought provoking moment. He said, and I am the great, 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 great grandson of the witches they. No, can I say it? Yeah, please. I said, I'm the reincarnation of the witches that they did burn. Yes, that's what you said. And that just really struck with me. And I said, I really want to get more into that, but I won't do that tonight, okay? But that was just something that resonated inside of me when he spoke those words. So a witch's profound belief is in the spirit of nature. This allows us to establish contact with everything that exists. When I say everything, I'm just speaking of nature. I have no religion. My religion is the earth, the moon, the stars, the water, the bones of the earth, the bones of the earth I speak of as the stones, the precious uh, gems that come from the earth. I myself, I wear rubies in my ear and those rubies will darken when evil threatens. When you come to wear the energy of the earth, you get to know it and, and it gets to know you. And when I say, um, it darkens. So on the right side, if it darkens in that ear, how do I know it's dark? Do I look around and say, is it dark today? No, I don't do that. But it'll start to itch. It'll start to burn. And I'll take the earring out and I'll look at it. And it's very, 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 very dark. That lets me know that negative energy from the male energetic field is coming my way. And if it happens on the right side, I mean, I'm sorry, on the left side, then it's the feminine energy. So that has proven each and every time that something difficult was coming my way. My earrings will let me know, or the stones that I wear. So that's just part of it. Um, tapping into the earth, grounding, earthing as we call it, walking barefoot as much as you can, sitting and resting up against the trees, uh, speaking with the trees because they will speak back. And I mean, I know you know several tree huggers. Uh, I am one of them and I encourage everybody to have that relationship with a tree, you know, choose a tree, you know, hang out in your backyard and, and just kind of hang with nature that way. Uh, she will bless you tremendously. So I found that, and I'm going to be using pretty much my notes because I got so many things to say in such a short time. I found that psilocybin enhances my innate ability sevenfold, thus allowing nature itself to entrust her most precious secrets in the witch's care. Through regular use of psychedelics, I believe a highly developed witch may stop or bring the rain, raise or calm the wind. And we do have our weather witches. 
we do have our witches that we call kitchen witches. We do have those that are healers. And uh, well, all of us are healers because we're here to serve. Um, so in, in nature, we deal with the solstices. We have the equinox coming up. What is that in a couple of days on the 21st? We'll have the um, fall equinox. And what I do on those times is that I will treat my crown, my hair with a spiritual washing and I'll add rainwater and different herbs. And what this does is restore my energy for the rest of the winter and kind of go into a hibernation. I just want to share a few of those herbs that I put into the rainwater so that you might maybe even write them down and do so yourself. Because you find that when you get in with the rhythm of the planet, things unfold a whole lot better for you. So some of the herbs that I use uh, for my infusion are rose buds. They offer healing, luck, love, divination, protection, and, and psychic powers. Rosemary for protection, sage for wisdom and longevity. Fever few, protection against colds and fevers, as well as accidents. Hyssop, purification, blocks evil and negativity. Althea, psychic power stimulator. Lavender oil, happiness, peace, sleep, love, protection and rose oil, and that goes with the same uh, with the rose buds. And of course, I'll add a little bit of money oil, seven drops and some Florida water. This is what I use on each of the solstices and the equinoxes just to enhance my powers. Um, so using what nature has provided because she has given us everything we need to cure ourselves and to move forward in a peaceful way on this planet. But as you all know, the planet is in trouble right now. And I believe that this, um, the patriarchal energy was ushered out in 2012. The matriarchal energy is now present and is getting stronger and stronger each year. It has fallen into our laps to help heal this planet. And it comes very strong when you take your psychedelics. It's almost as if we're in a hurry. We need to get this work done. So. Not saying that the men have messed up tremendously. I think I did just say that. But we are, um, it's been put in our laps to heal in a way that's necessary. It's a mothering that needs to take place. So, and so I contact the great mothers of all times, my grandmothers and their mothers and their mothers and their mothers. They seem to come through on these psychedelic journeys and we have a phenomenal conversation and they give me magic spells to do and chance to say and people to meet up with in order to get this energy off and um, start the healing process. So the galactic gift that psilocybin is to the planet and to those brave enough to take the journey will undoubtedly be met with their, with their selves, be you healer, philosopher, musician, or witch. And um, well, in my story, my last name, Iyi, the word Iyi or the name Iyi means oracle. And we believe in Africa that when a name is spoken and the meaning of that name is said, it gives that person that energy each and every time the name is spoken. So Ayana Iyi, Ayana means beautiful flower. Thank you very much. And Iyi means oracle because my work, the work that I do, I do read the tarot. I do use uh, divination as my method of work. I use scrying mirrors. Um, I work with the bones. Uh, these are the things that I do in order to um, just enhance, enhance my world. So I wanna kind of get into the, hmm, the history of witchcraft, which has been a fear the history of witchcraft is a history of fear. It is the demonization of the sacred feminine. So I'm gonna kind of start there inside of the um, history of it. So between the 16th and 19th centuries, people in the rural areas of Central Europe would exhibit strange symptoms from time to time. Dementia, facial distortions, hallucinations, uh, convulsions, paralysis, the cattle would stop producing milk, and other, form, and other farm animals would also behave strangely. And on many occasions, those people were persecuted by religious zealots, and they were tried as witches and subject to the cruelest of tortures. Thousands were executed in the name of Christianity. 
we know now that people were not possessed by evil spirits, but were exhibiting signs of ergot or ergot poisoning, ergotism. Ergot poisoning is um, a fungus that's on rye and barley. And when this was baked in the bread, a chemical similar to LSD that causes visions, convulsions, and often interpreting a demonic expression, well, of course, that scared the people and they did not know exactly what was going on. And oftentimes these women uh, that were persecuted, they lived in rural areas. So out in the woods and they're, they're picking these different things and they're, they're eating these different things. And so they would come across these particular uh, fungi um, and this is how it all really, part of it, part of it, I must say, got started. So by strange coincidence, a fungus sealed the fate of many a soul in both the old and the new world and uh, who were falsely accused, accused of witchcraft, okay? Um, I mean, to be a witch is to be a healer, is to be a seer, is to be a giver, is to be a teacher. And I say to those present now that if this is your walk, please walk it with honor and integrity and light. I am my ancestors' wildest dreams because I can sit here and I can say to you, yes, this is my craft. I am a witch, W-I-T, wit, and then there's a craft. I deal with the earth and, and the, the moon and the stars and it is my craft. So I put my wit, my wise woman energy with my craft and that gives me that. A lot of the men back in the 15th and 16th centuries were in awe of our power and because of their frail egos, and I'm not bashing them, but because of their frail egos, they decided that women, weak women, had a place and they needed to shut up and not have so much power. They were so in awe of us that the men of that era decided to wear robes in order to trick the energy into thinking that they were women so that they can gain that power. I mean, I'm serious. You look back, you see the robes that the men wore and that was the reasons for that. So European witches specifically were said to have, had, have, have used hallucinogenics when, um, to produce the psychedelic energy of flying. So let me tell you what that's about. I know you all have heard of the uh, Amanita muscaria or the red cap fly agaric. And um, so what that would be, the Tura, Nightshade, Belladonna, Henbane, Wolfsbane, Mandrake. Um, these uh, plants would give the sensation of flying, but the way that they use them, they would take this particular plant of their choice. They would rub it on a long stick, similar to a broom stick. Hang in there with me, guys. They would rub it on the stick. Then they would take and put that stick in between their legs so that the membranes of the vagina and the anus would get this particular sensation and it would cause them to have the sensation of flying. So the, the myth of women flying through the air on a broomstick at night came from basically that energy. That is the source of it, is that they would use it and that's how they would get their psychedelic energy going on. I mean, I thought that was kind of cool to get on a broomstick and rub it back and forth and then go there. Um, sounds pretty amazing to me. So just knowing that the plants that I just named, they're very, very, very dangerous. And if they're ingested, they can stop the heart within minutes. So you have to be careful with things that you don't know much about, okay? Modern day witchcraft, well, you, well, let's talk about the cauldron, okay? The cauldron is symbolic to a woman's womb, okay? And that's where I come to you from tonight, is from the most darkest, mysterious place which is a woman's womb. And so you guys who are trying to solve the mysteries of the world, you're never gonna do it because we are the mystery of the world. And so you could just forget about it. But the, womb, the, the cauldron, we do a lot of work with this. And this would be a perfect night to try some cauldron magic because it's the new moon, okay? And what I do with my cauldron on new moons and on full moons, 
I will, I, I gather my rainwater, preferably the rainwater that has come through a thunder and lightning storm. I'll collect that rainwater in glass only, uh, never plastic because the energy is not there. Um, I'll put it in my cauldron. On the full moon, I'll go outside with maybe one or two grams of dried mushrooms inside of me. I'll have the moonlight hit that rainwater inside my cauldron and I'll go in to a trance state and the visions that are given to me there are prophetic indeed. I can go in with an agenda or not, but the energy that I get is from the psychedelics, the moon, the rainwater, it all works together. And if your agenda is um, just maybe some self-discovery, you'll find it in that cauldron. So every woman should have a cauldron. It represents the womb, dark and mysterious. I also use, I, I spoke of it before, uh, a scrying mirror, okay? I have props here, guys. This is a scrying mirror, all right? Now, you're not supposed to let anybody really look inside of your scrying mirror because it's all about you. But because we're on this uh, medium here, you're not really looking to, in into it at all. Your energy won't get into that. And the objective to scrying, you again, take your two or three grams. Do you have to take psychedelics to scry? No, you do not. But will it enhance the energy? Of course it will. And the objective could be just uh, personal guidance. It could be prophecy. It could be revelations or in inspiration, but never reflection. Some of us have dark things swirling around us. It can reveal those dark things that are swirling around you inside of your scrying mirror. So if you are a person who is dealing with a certain level of fear or secrets or stuff you need to move on, but you got it held in your root chakra, you probably need to have a little bit more expression before you get into a scrying mirror because then that is indeed for the more advanced uh, practitioner of the craft. I don't believe that you can be taught witchcraft. I do believe that it is a bloodline. And I think you know this early on in life that this is your walk. Um, so to say, I wanna teach you how to do witchcraft, that's not what you do. You know, it's either a part of you or it's not. And you, and you will know this, you know. Um, so scrying um, are some of the tools that we use. I have particular items here as I used to clean houses, not literally, but figuratively speaking, I would go to a person's resident and I would know right off whether I was gonna be dealing with an entity that was there, okay? And I stopped doing the work because I have a grandchild who is now four years old, well, five years old now. And I found that sometimes in cleaning those houses, uh, the energy that was there that I was moving on, if it was strong enough, it could attach itself to me and I could bring it out of the house, but it would kind of hang out with me for a while. Why and how do I know that? I can tell you, psychedelics have helped me tap into that intrinsic part of myself that can tap into the other world. And when they see or feel me coming, they let it be known that they know that uh, I can see them and they can see me. Uh, just a quick story. My sister lost her life. Um, few years ago, she <clears throat> kind of lost her mind there. So she was in a mental institution and I went to see her and I sat in front of her and her left eye did something very strange. But in that strangeness, that let me know that the entity revealed itself to me saying, I know you know I'm here. And with that being said, I knew that I had work to do and I told her, I'll be back. And I came back with my tools. But before I left, I asked her, I said, what is it you'd like me to bring you? And she said, some cherries. And so I kissed her lightly on her neck. And I said, I'll be back on Wednesday with the cherries. But I also was coming back to get with that entity because I believe that I had been preparing my entire life to save her life from the energy that was stored inside of her. Entities will enter a body when we are fearful, when we are deeply troubled through depression, if we are serious drug addicts or alcoholics, 
Um, these entities are just moving about the planet and you can see them very clearly when you're on a journey because sometimes they'll get so close in your face they'll scare the heck out of you inside of depending on how many grams you take. But anyway, I kiss my sister on her neck. I'm coming back to get this entity. Six hours later, I get a phone call and they tell me that my sister is unresponsive. She died. She, she died. And I feel like that entity was like, you know, I've worked too hard and too long to get this information, uh, to get this person to where I want them. And I'm not going to leave them now. So they took her life. She died right then and there. And they still can't tell me to this day what happened to her. She just, I believe it revealed itself to her in the mirror. And she passed away from here. So entities, people, Understand that they are real, they're out here. If you take your psychedelics on a regular basis, you can push that energy back because they get afraid. They're like toxins in the body. It's like when you take a fast and you start fasting, you get sicker before you get better. Your lower extremities start to tingle, your lips, your ears. That's kind of the way an entity possession is because once you start to do the spiritual work, the spiritual cleansing, um, they fight. They don't want to leave you. They work too long. That You're their host. They belong there. They can actually have you meet a person that you don't particularly care for. But their entity and your entity will hook up and cause nothing but havoc in your life. So spiritual cleansing, spiritual baths, washing your head with the herbs that I spoke of, um, and spiritual bathing is very important to the psychonaut because we are tapping into other uh, universes, different worlds out there. And even um, if we're not psychonauts, a spiritual bath is very important for those of us who are on a journey. And again, you wanna use items from the earth, a metal bucket or a porcelain bowl or a glass bowl, coconut soap, patchouli, cinnamon, Florida water, a raw egg, eggs pull energy from the body raw egg in a shell. Rainwater is preferred, but spring water is okay. Um, a seven day gold or white candle, um, a wrap made out of linen, silk, or cotton, because it has to be natural. But you take these baths once a week on the day in which you were born, no electric light, and you cover the mirror. Because oftentimes when we're washing off energy from us, it can get trapped in that mirror if you don't cover it, it can get trapped in the electrical light because that's energy and it can just not leave your house and it can just wait for the opportunity to get back inside of you. Pay attention to the people that you meet. I would clean the houses with sea salt. I would clean the houses with red Louisiana salt. Very, very powerful. I can only get this in New Orleans. I would clean the houses with black witches salt. Very, very hard to get but very, very necessary as the tools that a witch needs in order to deal with some of the energies out here. And also, of course, there's sweet grass that brings in the sweet energy after you clean the house for people. So all of this that I'm telling you came about in the 20 years that I have been taking psychedelics. It enhanced who I am. It's always been there. It's been a part of me forever, but it just brought it to the forefront. Um, the massage therapist can see the meridian lines. The musician can see the notes and understand that music comes from a whole nother galaxy. Um, it's such a beautiful fungi and it's truly a gift to this planet. And I encourage those who have not partaken in this energy to please do so. Because if you're on this program, if you're looking at us and, and, and listening, you're very interested and you're almost there if you haven't taken them. Okay. So fire, water, earth, air is all a part of the journey and it only is enhanced by psilocybin. Um, women are circling more than they have ever circled before. We are doing something that is very ancient, very powerful, and we go into these circles in nature and we all take three grams and we connect it synergistically by our wombs. That's where the women go and connect. And it tells us that we have to be about saving this planet. Um, when we have tapped into the energy with the men and the women, 
which I'll never do again if I can help it, the men seem to want to fight battles and their wars and they turn into these different animals and we're so busy watching them doing their thing until it just never works. So staying in nature, doing the work or alone in the dark, preferably naked, taking your journey and doing the work. I say preferably naked because your clothes have energy in them. Um, your sheets have energy in them. So, you know, all of this is there. And the, 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 the psychedelics will let you know whether they want you to have on clothes or not. So hopefully you are not, you know, your gatekeeper is not a shy person because you lose all inhibitions when you take the mushrooms. And for you advanced psychonauts, I know that you don't need a gatekeeper, but we, uh, we kind of have a protocol saying that first you take five grams, which gives visual, uh, visual acuity you know, things start to um, dissipate, disappear. You, the, the heavens open up to you. Seven grams brings about um, the sacredness of sex. We'll talk about that a little later. And nine grams prepares you for the galactic journey. Um, you start to, you know, lose your, your bodily energy. I personally turn into liquid and I go through these tubes through the multiverse. I found it kind of difficult to get through those tubes sometimes because I have very long hair and my hair would stop me. But I found that when I sage my hair prior to a journey, it would dissolve as well because I was taking that energy off that was keeping me earthbound. So I would sage all this hair. My hair comes down past my behind. So I had to get, you know, hair collects energy, but to move it out of the way, it allowed me to go through those tubes of liquid, being liquid and going through the tubes to a different galaxy in and of itself. What a journey. I have so many journeys that I could talk about, but of course I will not, uh, but I remember each and every one of them. Um, so that's, you know, fertility is a large part of what we do. Um, when the women are gathering and we're on three grams together in nature, if there is a woman who's newly pregnant, that child, even in that embryonic state, will reach out and let us know that that woman is pregnant or she's going to be pregnant within the next couple of months. That's how deep this is. And I think you all know that. So witchcraft, you know, if uh, to all my witches out there, um, blessed be, uh, I am your sister. We are sisters. Um, it is just, you know, there are many parts of a woman and this is just one part of myself right here. I need you to know that there are many locks. Wherever there is a lock, there's a key. And psilocybin is the key. And of course you're the lock. And when you put that together and you turn that energy, it all opens up to you. And I tell you in that expression to allow it to do so. So um, I'm gonna move from the witchcraft area and I'm gonna go right into a quote from Baba Kalindi. He said, the most important thing I think I've discovered dealing with psilocybin is that we're not hooked to the body. There's no end, there's no death. Consciousness goes on and it's a trip and an exploration, Kalindi E. This was an article that was written about him. And I'm gonna share with you his last moments here on this earth um, because it was very profound. He died the way that he lived. He did it his way and there was no fear. I mean, and if you all understand uh, the slang that I'm about to say, he died like a G y'all, it's what he did, you know? So. He said to me in his last minutes, he says, Ayana, I want you to cut the light out, leave the room and close the door. It was something in his eyes. It was the sound in his voice. And I backed up without any hesitation. I left and I did exactly what he asked me to do. But about maybe 20, 30 seconds later, I was like, no, no, no. No, you, you're going to the hospital. I'm, go, I'm going back into the room and I go back into the room and he's gone. I mean, he, he, he felt it, he knew it, it was time. He wanted to do it alone and he did it very bravely and there was no fear. He just found that wormhole opportunity and he slipped through it and 
And I can feel them right now just tingling all through me as I say those words, because that lets me know that I am on the right track and he is blessing everything that I'm saying. So you all who were following Kalindi, just know that um, everything that he talked about, the exploration and the high level of consciousness, he is doing it right now. I don't believe that he's going to come back through again through reincarnation. I do believe that he has ascended to a place. I do believe that he is a celestial being. Uh, because of all the information, he completed his work on this earth. And now he's a part of the multiverse where he is indeed whispering in everyone's ear. And I say that part because my granddaughter, who is a mushroom baby, when I say mushroom baby, her mother took three grams of psilocybin when she was maybe in her second month of pregnancy. Um, Amor was sitting with me one day after Baba passed and she says to me, Umi, you know Baba is still teaching, right? And I says, Amor, how do you know that? And she said, well, he whispers in everybody's ear. And um, it was just, you know, just the very innocent way that she said it and she just kept coloring. And I suppose he must have whispered in her ear at that time because she picked up the energy, you know, and she passed it on to me. And she said, also, they're rebuilding him, so don't worry. You know, now this is a five-year-old, but this is a five-year-old who is a mushroom baby. Um, so needed you to hear that part about Baba. So let's get right into the uh, death portion of this talk, again, with my notes. And so a large proportion of human suffering occurs because people think they only live once. However, when they become fully aware that their present life is only one point in the eternal flow of time and that they have lived in the past and will live again in the future, they will understand that their future lives will depend on their present life. Now, I'm going to say that again, that their future lives depend on their present life and also that they can choose what kind of life they will live in the future. I mean, can you imagine that, that you can choose how you're going to live in the future? Now, this was taken from the book, The Essence of Buddha, okay? I'm going to try to convey the natural rhythm of death and dying and how psychedelics can help us access the realm of the dead, which is what I'm sure Baba did on some of his higher journeys. Um, and I call him affectionately Baba, Baba Kalindi. Um, so that's who I'm speaking of when I say Baba. The journey, the journey has to be a fearless journey, but it's a journey of ascension. And when I say fearless, I mean, you see that right now, John Hopkins University are doing major studies on the terminally ill. They are um, uh, injecting psilocybin um, through the veins now to help people cross over in a more uh, peaceful way. And these studies are working. So, um, making the journey of dying as fearless as possible is something that needs to happen because fear, fear is the one thing that will take you out of this game, guys. I mean, and that's what's going on on the planet right now. And I'm not going to go far too far into what's happening because we all know that COVID is here and it's across the world and it's about a new world order. I'm going to stop. However, fear is the greatest weapon that has been used against us. It's being used against us right now as I speak. And uh, with all these people dying, the first thing you hear or is on your phone being broadcast on the television, how many people have died. That's frightening for people, you know, just to know that this is happening. So the mind is an incredible mass of circuitry. My preferred method of travel, of course, is psilocybin. And um, I've been able to tap into the particular area of circuitry that deals with death and dying and ancient memory. And when I say ancient memory, I'm speaking of the limbic system. It's very old. It's where old memories are stored of your past lives, um, journeys uh, that you have taken through maybe three and 400 years of reincarnation, okay? More often than not, I've traveled to what I believe is the fifth dimension. The fifth dimension, is it a star system? Is it heaven? Terrence McKenna believed mushrooms were a chemical message from another star system 
and that they were a gateway for telepathic communication. Communication with other beings and dimensions occurs with greater ease and occurs more widely when your attention is turned from the outer world into the inner world. The mushrooms help balance the flesh and spirit, sort of a testing of the soul. The spirit world is the real home of the soul. I want you to take a journey with me. This is on one of my, one of my trips. Um, so I ingest my eight or nine grams and um, 30, 45 minutes into it, the gates of another dimension begins to open and my guides greet me. And I'm standing in this incredible mass of circuitry in my consciousness. Um, suddenly I take a left turn. I'm being swept away toward what I believe is the fifth dimension because I'm passed by ghosts, I'm passed by spirits, I'm passed by elementals, I'm passed by entities. But I wanna take a minute and I want to explain the difference between a ghost and a spirit because there is a difference. Ghosts are similar to psychotic human beings, incapable of reasoning for themselves, okay? A psychotic human being, incapable of reasoning for themselves. So when you have a haunting, they're wreaking havoc in the home. You get the chill, you're feeling this ugly, malevolent energy. These are oftentimes ghosts. These are people that are trapped. These are souls that are trapped. Real quick, because I am a reader, I do this type of work. Young woman called me and she asked for a reading. But when we were on the phone, I got a searing headache talking to her. And I was really like, I don't think I want to deal with this lady because my head is hurting very bad. And I knew that that was a signal, but I, I felt the urgency and that she needed help. I allowed her to come to my home. Upon her getting to my home, I felt the energy around her and I started to get a little queasy inside. There was something that was attached to her. So as she sat with me, I asked her, had she lost anybody in the last six months to a year? And she said, well, yes, my cousin, he was shot in the head as he slept. So now, this young man was asleep. Someone shot him in his head with no knowledge of what he's just ripped away from his physical self and he's thrown out there and it's like, okay, what, what's going on? What's, what, what's happening here? And um, that headache that I got talking to her on the phone was obviously the pain in the head and that we needed to talk to. So once we, once we talked about it, the pain started to subside. But however, this young man found comfort with me. And when this woman left, he stayed with me and he stayed with me for a couple of days, but because I have the energy and the information and no fear, I was able to help him cross over. So he was, he was a ghost, but by the time our work finished, he was led into that spirit world. Now a spirit, spirits on the other hand are surviving personalities of all of us who pass through the door of death in a relatively normal fashion. So a ghost, psychotic in energy will cause and wreak havoc in the household, move stuff around, knock stuff over, just be, well, you heard the word, um, what is it, uh, poltergeist. Poltergeist meaning playful ghosts. Some of them are not so playful. So back into my journey. Suddenly I stop. Once again, I am someplace else, a different terrain. And I believe it's limbo, purgatory, the place between life and death. And for some reason, it seems that I've been charged with the energy of helping people to cross over, people that are lingering between life and death. And um, each and every time that I've journeyed, for the most part, unless I've journeyed with someone, that is the work that I have to do. A young man, this is one of my journeys. A young man was in the war and I believe it was the Iraqi, Iran war. And um, his name was Sonny. His troop had left him. They thought they left him for dead. They couldn't find him. He was out there, but he was dying. He told me in this journey that he had left home because his mother was in a domestic relationship that was, uh, she was being abused by this man. And whenever he would try to talk to his mother about it, she would get angry with him. So he left and he joined the service. He wanted his mother so bad while he was laying there dying until the mushrooms seemed to just put me in that place of his mother there. And I was able to hold him in that interdimensional realm 
and talk with him and soothe him until he crossed over. And I found that, you know, because this is the work that I do, I've had to accept that and deal with that. And so I've been given a gift to where I have a very intimate relationship with death, whether I am on psychedelics or not. I can generally know when someone is going to take that journey. Did I know that Baba Kalindi was going to go? I had seen his death, but of course, him being with me and my husband for 21 years, I was in complete denial. Death had been visiting the household for a minute. You pull up, death be sitting on the porch. Three weeks later, you pull up, death is sitting on your couch. You know, and I'm like, okay, so what are you doing here? So I really thought it was me. I thought it was me that was going to leave this place. Uh, never in a million years, you could have told me it was going to be Baba Kalindi. So Once again, I'm snatched up, and this time I am moving faster through these tubes that I spoke about, you know, and uh, I am, again, now I'm in my bedroom, and I open my eyes, and inside of my bedroom, there are all these people, but they're outlined in red electricity. They're men, they're women, they're children, they, some are dressed in ancient clothing, some have on clothing of the 1800s, suspenders, weird hats. Some uh, have weapons and they're just kind of standing there staring at me. And I'm like scared, okay? I'm like, what in the heck is this? So I go under my covers. I'm like, I don't want to see this. I don't want to do this. I'm under the cover. I come back out and they're standing there, but now they're even closer. And it's if they need me to say something or they want to tell me something. And I feel like had I taken just a little bit more, I would have been able to understand exactly what it is that they wanted, but they were just kind of standing there. It wasn't a welcoming energy. It was an information. It was like, I'm to give them or they're to give me. And I had to step out of that place of fear in order for that energy to absolve itself. So this is my journey when I take the psilocybin. And um, some of them did step forward and greet me and, and, and they allowed me to remember an ancient time in my life. They took me on a journey. So death to me, yes, I miss Baba Kalindi. Of course I do. That is the physical aspect of it. Do I get it? Of course I do. I understand it and I accept it. Am I afraid of it? Absolutely not. Do I hope that I could do it the way that Kalindi did it when he said, you know what? Y'all leave because I got something to do. Death, is that you? Come on, let's rock. You know, and that's basically how that went down. So dealing with reincarnation, which is what I speak of when I say get on the rhythm of the planet by your summer solstices and your winter solstices. So what happens? What's happening now here in Detroit, of course, and across the world, some places, we're coming into fall, which means that the leaves are gonna come off the trees, die. Everything is gonna be barren. We're gonna get the snow and everything goes to sleep. Basically, that's what we do. We go into a deep sleep when we die. And then we're awakened again on the other side. You know, and that consciousness gets to maybe choose where it wants to be at, whether it wants to come back through again. Uh, you get to choose your parents this time around again, or whether you just want to stay in that place and just hang out in the fifth dimension with everybody, because that it seems to where souls be most comfortable at. I'm going to stop right here and say that there are more souls on this planet right now than there are people. And that is because all what is going on. And some of those souls, people think because you die, you're benevolent. No. If you're bad on this side, you're going to be bad on that side. And you're going to be entities and energies waiting for that host to open up through depression, fear, alcoholism, drugs, and you're waiting to get in the body and wreak havoc. So those are the guys I'm not talking about. I'm talking about those hanging out in the fifth dimension, talking stuff, talking shop, hanging out, you know, like, you know, this is a really cool place to be. You know, I'm not saying let's go ahead on and die, y'all, so we can hang out in the fifth dimension. No, we're hanging on the list life because that's what our ego tells us to do. We're here. We're here for a purpose. And when our purpose has been revealed to us, we will move on. When the soul has no more use for this body, this vessel, it will move on. So harmony is what we seek with the earth. Nature 
is the way in which the divine speaks to humanity. It speaks through the magic plants that we have. Uh, the, 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 the plants allow us, they grant us access into another world, into different worlds for them to demonize and criminalize this beautiful fungi by telling me that it's illegal to explore my own consciousness is ludicrous. We're taking a stand now by speaking of decriminalizing nature. Um, Oakland, California, I believe Denver, we're, uh, Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan, we're moving in that direct in D Detroit. We're looking at decriminalizing nature so that we can be free to be who we are and start to heal this planet and move away the fear of dying and the seasonal rhythms that we need to get in touch with in order to feel free enough uh, to honor the process of, of course, living, but of course, of dying, okay? We live in a fear of consciousness and death for so many has been the biggest fear, yet there's a dread into going into the unknown. But I promise you, nine grams and above of psilocybin cubensis, maybe a hit of toad, that should start to cool you out. And um, of course, the way that we die has a profound effect on all of us because you know these human bodies, they rot, they stink, they get sick, they putrid energy comes from it. You know, our minds can really take us out of the place that we're in. Uh, human suffering is real. So if we can um, perhaps look in deeper into the psychedelics, some of those people may not want to take a five, seven, nine gram journey. I would say to you, maybe look into micro dosing, you know, taking a capsule every day or every other day would be very beneficial in cooling you out or leveling you out. It takes away the fear. It takes away the anxiety. Things start to be beautiful to you again. You can look into the blue sky with a green tree and a red bird and get completely turned on by that. You can wake up in the morning and hear the, the trees rustling and the wind blowing and a baby laughing and children singing and it's beautiful to you. And that's what I wish for each and every one of you is the beauty that is present in this life. And if psychedelics is the way to get us to that beauty so that we can heal and be comfortable with the life that we're living because so many people find it hard to live this life. And when it's hard to live this life, it's hard to make that journey, that transition into death. So death and dying is a part of who we are and it's what it is and psychedelics can definitely help you inside of that. Sex, sacred sex, seven grams and sex. You and your partner taking seven grams and having sex. The seven gram journey is like an aphrodisiac. What we call, uh, sometimes some of us don't need a partner. We will have what we call a mushroom orgasm, which can last for hours. Doesn't that sound like fun? An orgasmic energy for hours. <laughs> but yeah, you can do the but what? But when you're with a partner, someone who that you've experienced this journey with, or who who is an experienced traveler, and you're going into the journey on seven with the idea that we're going to have sacred sex, you become one flesh. The word is called henosis. H E N O I S. Henosis becoming one flesh. The body is joined together. You, you are just this one energy. And you start to understand that the magic that you make while you're making love on psychedelics is just what it is. And you get what is sacred about it. It's not about, I mean, we have a, what is this, a trillion billion dollar industry in uh, the sex world now, because it's all just it's a joke. I mean, people pay big money to watch somebody 
have an orgasm. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, and I'm not knocking porn, porn at all. I mean, it's, if that's your boat and you want to float it that way, go for it. However, when I speak of sacred energy and mating, creating magic between couples, be it two men, two women, a man and a woman, whatever is, whatever is your choice, if you take psychedelics and you go into that place, it opens up a whole new world for you in terms of uh, the energy that you're creating together. Now, can it be eight? Can it be nine? Can it be five? Generally, it's generally what I found to be between seven and eight for some reason, because again, five grams, visual acuity, seven grams, the aphrodisiac energy, a man will get an erection, he'll be agitated, he'll, he'll, he'll want to use that tool. Um, and a woman is very open to that because we tend to, you all know that if you take in the psychedelics, your body morphs into this energy and you can move differently and we spread our legs so wide and a light will come from the vagina which is inviting to the penis to enter into that light and take you into the dark energy of the womb and you rock and you roll for hours and hours and you speak in tongues and different languages and you're and you're throwing signs up in the air it's a, just a wonderful i think y'all know that i've done this before so um, it's just a wonderful journey. And I encourage you to, you know, make some babies with that. You know, I mean, can you imagine making babies off of, you know, two folks having a psychedelic experience and what type of child that you're bringing forth? So yeah, I encourage that. So that's pretty much um, the depth of the sex energy is just, you know, trying to tell you how this feels without you knowing about what I'm talking about is like almost a moot point. But go get you seven grams and try this out, you know, and um, I, when I said maybe nine or 10, it just doesn't, the body does not want to go into that position when you are galactically traveling because you're doing other work. You're still kind of earthbound in your fives and in your sevens. But when you go beyond that, you start to do the galactic energy. And so sex doesn't really happen there um, as a rule for me. I don't know about you guys. So, um, I'm not sure where we're at on time, Daniel. Um, we could answer some questions, maybe. I would, I would be open myself up to questions, absolutely, at this point. Cool. Um, one of the things, I mean, I almost want to talk about... you touched on things like preparation. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things that that, came, that stood out to me was when you were talking about the scrying mirror and that this is a practice that maybe you don't want to do if X, Y, and Z. And, you know, what I could feel like I could almost hear from the crowd is like, well, how do I get to that place? Like, how am I going to be able to clear my energy to the point where I can look in a mirror and know that I'm ready for that? A good question that I'm ready for that how do you ever know that you're really ready I mean in preparation it's like you are it's an inner energy that you're guided to seek out this knowledge your your your, your curiosity peaks um, you may a certain word could stir a memory, an ancient memory, that limbic system that I spoke of could stir a memory for you. There's trigger words that can make you say, oh, maybe I need to do this or look more into it. You can walk in a bookstore and a book can just fall in front of you and you can open the book up to the page that you, the message that you need in order to prepare you for what's next. I mean, these are the way, this is how things happen in the worlds that we're talking about. So preparation, how do I know that I'm ready for that? It's a knowing, it's a quickening, it's a, it's a feeling, it's a trusting, it's being present inside of yourself. And again, losing the fear. Now that's easier said than done, of course, but the fear keeps us blocked in so, so many ways. And just know that darkness has no respect for fear. So that's the biggest thing I can say is to lose the fear and just move forward. Be more than what you are, um, as Baba would say you know, go past this human energy and just step inside of it. I love the ownership that you put there, you know, because on one hand, it would be easy to say, 
well, you know, you sage like this and you wash like this and you take this herb and then you're ready. But instead you're saying, handle your fear. Handle your fear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest part of what we're, why, where we're stuck right now mm-hmm. is the fear, you know? And, and that's part of the divine, not divine, I'm sorry. That's part of the evil plan is to keep people afraid so that they won't grow, you know? Um, because when somebody is locked in fear, they can be controlled. The mm-hmm. power is all over them. I mean, it's just, you know, you're almost useless on this planet if you're walking around afraid. And that's how my sister lost her life. She was afraid. I said, sweetie, what are you scared of? And she said, everything. Can you imagine that? You know, so mm-hmm. you, you, you hinder and you limit your life. Yeah. And I think that that's a lot of the time what we're seeing when we're seeing rage, you know, all of this fighting, you know, is just a defense mechanism so people don't have to feel their fear. It's better, it's easier to be angry at something else. Isn't that something? And that's exactly what it is, rage. So much rage inside of us, but why? Why is this ancestral? Is this generational? You know, I say that if it is indeed that, once again, psychedelics is the key you know, to move that ancestral energy on or bring it forward so that you can deal with it. And again, that takes a certain amount of courage, you know, so people who are afraid that step forward anyway and do the work, those are the courageous people that we're talking about. That's what, that's what courage is. So overcoming fear by cultivating courage. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? Overcoming fear by cultivating courage. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, that's a whole other hour. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a whole yeah. other hour, but I'm going to um, read from some folks. Okay. Does spring water from a direct source or a river stand in for rainwater? Remember you were talking about rainwater? People yeah. want to know about spring waters and rivers and things like that. If they don't, because some places it doesn't rain. Okay. Well, and I never even considered that. Um, So I would go with spring water more so than um, from a, unless you know the, the, you know, the spring, uh, the the creeks that you may be gathering the water from the clarity of it, you know, that it's no toxic smudge that is running through Mm -hmm. it or through your city into that creek or river, you know, I would suggest that you use spring water as opposed to just river water, because we just really don't know with everything that's leaking into our um, waters these days. I would be careful with that. And to bathe in rainwater or to pour rainwater on the head is the most exhilarating experience that you can imagine. It is, uh, everything comes to life. The chakras start to spin. They, They start to connect. And your energy is brighter and you're happier and you've just been washed. Um, You've been washed by these heavenly energies, you know. So definitely, you know, if you cannot get the rainwater, spring water would be it, you know. And spring water is about as natural as you can get, you know, because, um, you know, the animals, when when we say we're drinking spring water, yes, osmosis has happened in some of these cases. But, you know, I mean, animals are, you know, they doing what they do in water, you know. Well, a moose might come and take a bath in the water and take a piss in that water, you know, but that's spring water for you, you know. Uh, the animals come and they drink that water, so it's cool. You know, you're part of nature, you know, but just know that the water that you're using has to be at least, well, not a whole lot of vibrations of that toxic stuff in it, you know. Right. I mean, it, what I hear is almost that you want to cultivate a, cultivate a relationship with your land. Definitely. That, that's part of the work that we do. I mean, it just taps you into, you're tapped into nature in such a way that you honor it, you know, um, cultivating the land. I mean, understanding the trees that are around you, you know, listening mm-hmm. to the energy of what they have to tell you when you sit next to them. Um, going and sitting by the water, the water has a language of its own. And if you're quiet enough, you can take your troubles to the water and they will take that energy from you mm-hmm. and then give it, give you what it is that you need. There's a ritual that I have and that I pass on to others that you go to a body of water, you honor the water by greeting Oshun, which is a Yoruba deity, and you pour honey as an offering into the water. 
but you take out your earrings, maybe that you've worn for three days, a pair of earrings that you don't particularly care for, but you throw those earrings into the water after you make an offering to that water. And you're asking the spirits of that water to answer questions for you. And then you sit in meditation because it's symbolic of you offering the honey as a gift, but the symbolism is throwing the earrings in so that you can hear what is coming at you. And you sit there and before you leave that body of water, you're given an energy of knowing, you know, um, and you don't have to do psychedelics to do that. It's just, you know, tapping into the land and cultivating nature, you know? Yeah, lovely. You know, my baby had never seen rain until a couple of weeks ago. Because and you're coming from California. Because oh we're goodness. coming from California. And we walked out, you know, we do like a morning walk, you know, 6.30, 7 in the morning. And it was one of those mornings where it had just rained and it was the atmosphere. Yes. You know, the wet. yes. And we walked out and he was just like, you know, he was like half asleep. And then he was like, what is, Yes. what is this? this is like oh, a, no. Are we on a different planet? Oh, that was priceless, I bet. You know, yeah. you know exactly what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. It's so necessary. So, I mean, I don't want to go all into that, Daniel, but I would like to know how long it hadn't rained where you were coming from. Your baby is nine months old, but I know he was, wasn't aware at two and three months. But how long have you all been without rain in California? There wasn't. I mean, maybe there was some when he was like itty bitty in the winter. You know, sometimes it would rain in December or January. He was born in November. Okay. But I don't, you know, there's not a lot of rain. You know, there's there's certainly not a, not a lot of memories of rain and things like that. Everybody kind of leave California and come to Detroit. Just come hang out. That's where you need to be. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Um. Somebody wants to know, and I'm kind of curious about this too, because I read the Thoth deck. I'm curious what tarot deck you read. Um, well, mine is a ancient Egyptian tarot deck mm -hmm. um, that I've used over the years, many, many years. Um, and I use that particular deck because of the images. It seems to resonate more with me and you know, it just kind of sends the energy to the back of my brain where mm -hmm. those pictures are able to talk to me in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So I use an ancient, and so the pictures on the cards are uh, Egyptian glyphs and um, that that's what I've always used. You know, I've looked at different decks. I tried to feel them. I would place them on my altar just to see if I could connect with them, but it just didn't work. I'm just where I'm at with the ancient Egyptian deck. It's just a part of who I am. I resonate deeply and strongly with the comedic energy. Always have. Well, you you kind of touched the back. You said the back of your head. So you have like a real body sensation. You have like a real body awareness around the tarot. Definitely. Definitely. And it just, when I go to the, it's like, it's like I'll look, they'll flip and they go to the back of my, it's hard to explain, but that's where the information is at for me. And it, and it comes forward through speaking, I always greet thoughts and honor thoughts before I do a reading. And I thank the energy for the divine genius that it took for thoughts to create the tarot, because this is where I truly believe it comes from. Um, this scribe here, this, this magical energy so I always ask for prayers from that energy. I have a huge statue that I, when I do my readings, that it sits in front of me and I give that energy and I ask that this reading is blessed by that energy. For, and I thank it for giving me the ability to see the truth, to speak the truth and know the truth when I'm speaking the truth. And I ask for particular blessings for the reading from that energy. So ancient Egyptian, yeah, it works very well for me. Mm. Let's see. What's a good amount? I'm, I'm nervous to ask this. What's a good amount of grams to take for someone who's five months pregnant? Okay. Well, I have a young lady here who is six months pregnant and she's taken six grams. Mm -hmm. She said that it, um, her and the baby were able to communicate, um, very fluidly, um, now, because we don't have a lot of data, 
I cannot tell this woman to say, take six grams or mm -hmm. take three grams or seven grams. No, I cannot do that because I don't have that particular information yet. But we are gathering this data from the women who are now taking the psilocybin while they're pregnant because we're looking at um, ingesting while you're pregnant. We're looking at ingesting through labor and delivery. We're looking at women who are breastfeeding and taking psilocybin and feeding this to the children. Um, we're looking at changing the entire paradigm of this planet with these new babies that are coming in that are definitely going to take us into a whole nother place of being because they've got a lot of work to do. And this is a very important work that we're doing now. So again, young lady who asked the question, what, how much should you take? I cannot really answer that. But again, it's your own personal journey. The woman who took the six grams at six months, um, I'm anxious to meet and talk with her child uh, upon its arrival, because <laughs> I'm sure that she, the child will have some conversation for me. So mm -hmm. you have to use your own discretion in that. How many have you taken prior to your pregnancy? That was my question. Oh. Is it this, well, that was, it, wasn't my, it wasn't my question. It, that, that was the question that emerged as we were talking. As okay. You said you had this woman who was taking six grams of six months. It'd be my guess that she had a strong practice already. Yes, she did. Yes, she that did. wasn't she just uh, every well, she was microdosing and then was like oh let's try six grams well, no 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 this is something that's been a part of her life for a while and her body is very um um receptive to mm -hmm. being open that way so yeah but the data we're gathering is going to be exciting i'm working on um on a documentary as as it relates to this you mm -hmm. know psilocybin and uh women who are pregnant birth and delivery and breastfeeding and hopefully in another year or so, we'll have that information for you. And all the women who want to be a part of this, please give me a call, a holler, because I would love to talk to you and your experiences. How do, there's a lot of questions that say, how do we get in touch with her? She's fantastical. Why are you so fabulous? I love you. Aww. Can I have your contact info? Absolutely. Well, uh, right now it's just, you know, because social media is the way in, um, that would be the way to contact me, and that would be Ayana, A Y A N A, Ife, I F E, last name E E, I Y I, Ayana Ife E E. And if you tap into me on Facebook, I'll friend you, and then I'll pass my number on to you like that, and we can uh, communicate that way. Absolutely. I would love to uh, continue the work this way. You know, and build community is what we're doing by having this program that you're having, Daniel, is building community. Because I can promise you, this is the way of the new world, not what they're trying to put on us now. I believe that is a block for what's growing now. I mean, psilocybin, ayahuasca, bufo, alvarius, toad is on the planet right now in such a way because it's necessary. It's here right now because we need it right now. A change has to happen and it's going to happen with this. I mean, even racism, which is a sickness, you take that medicine and you're cured from racism. I can promise you that that is the key. I've got three officers in a particular state, three police officers that are microdosing. If I had my way, the entire police force all over the world would be microdosing. You keep your edge, but you're not crazy. You don't shoot people seven times in the back for just the heck of it, you know? It just puts you in a place of understanding. So I probably went all the way from that question, but you know, just I felt okay. very passionate to get that energy off to you. I don't even know what the question was. I don't either, but that's what I felt to say. Yeah. That's, what we, that's, what we, that's why you're here. Okay. Uh, Johan, is, Johan wants to know about what about male witches? What about what? Male witches. Male, well... I, it's a very open-ended question, Johan. But what 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 about men? I mean, they they're I mean, men are they they give us the balance. I mean, you know, I mean, let's talk about the wizards and the sorcerers. You know, I mean, the word warlock is ah, that's just kind of a more malevolent energy, from what I understand. But you know, there are men who have this stirring inside of them, the magic. And when I say magic, I'm not speaking of performance magic. I'm speaking of the occult magic. You feel it. You know it. You understand it. It walks with you. It wakes you up. It puts you to sleep. 
you know this energy. You don't even have to ask about it. You start to seek it on your own. You'll find yourself in places that you don't, you know, that, that, that you, your, your spirit has taken you to because your spirit is asking to be fed. It's actually, the spirit is actually maybe even stepping out of the way because it can be full of ego and it allows the soul to come forth when it does that. And when it does that, then you can tap into what this soul needs in order to continue on its journey. So male witches, you know, definitely, definitely. We're always looking for the balance. I mean, I believe that, you know, my life with Baba Kalindi was heightened because of who I am, but that's what connected us was who I am and what I was to him. He allowed that energy to be free in me and um, express myself in that way. And I in turn was able to um, allow him to be as free as he could possibly be. Um, so was he a male witch? Nope, he was an explorer, a psychonaut, um, someone who was far beyond his years in terms of what we're dealing with on this planet now. I believe he came from the future, you know, to give us the information in that when it was time to go back, he just went back. He gave us just what we needed. So witch, warlock, wizard, sorcerer. Yeah, 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 do your thing. I mean, seek the information, you know, take your journey. Go ahead on and take 12 or 13 grams and get to know that male witch on that level. Somebody wants to know about weight, calibrating dosage to their weight. If somebody is small or if somebody is big. That's, you know, that is very interesting. I've had men who have been 300 pounds, take five grams and lose it, you know? And then I've had uh, men who were, I don't know, maybe 145 take 15 grams and not really even go there. So it's not even about weight. I'm, you know, I would love to know more about how that works, the physiology, the body, and how it accepts it. Um, I would love to know more about that myself, you know, in terms of weight, because I found that it has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's all about your level of, your, your consciousness. You know, it's not about the body, it's about the mind. Psychedelics mean what? Mind expanding. Hallucinate means what? To wander through your own mind. They tell us we only use 10% of our brain and the other 90 lies dormant. Well, hell, you know, I can take five grams and go visit that other 90% and go to different terrains, alien terrains, you know, you know it's an alien terrain. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter how much you weigh. So I imagine the person that asked the question may have had a problem inside of that, thinking that their weight was an issue. It's not an issue. It's where your brain is at. It's set and setting also helps with that. Right. Cool. Okay. It's because it's interesting because I'm, you know, I'm a big guy and, and, and at different times, different amounts, like it's, it is almost random. Okay. It is almost, you know, how something affects me. So can I ask it, you in your bigness, how many grams you have taken and has it, you know, have you been to that place that you wanted to be at? Did you ever think that your weight might have been a problem? No, no, no. I don't think my weight has ever been a problem, but it's just interesting that sometimes in my life, I'm very sensitive okay. to strong substances. And then other times in my life, it just, it's, I can just, you know, process it all. I just, you know, yeah. like I kind of keep executive control and like, it's like, oh, this is, this is weird, but okay. Now my son is, and I promise you, he's about 340 pounds. Okay. I'm um, not that, I'm not that big. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like six, four, really. He looks like Thanos sometimes to me, you know, just a big old dude. Um, and he's taken up to 17 grams and he just didn't go there the way he hear, hears everybody speak about going mm. there, but he can take about three capsules, open them up and put them in his coffee and he can have a nice little journey there. He yeah. can feel that energy. So I wish I knew the answers for that, but I just don't. Yeah. I just think that it's, I mean, just be attentive, you know, it's just, it, it's all an exploration, right? That's exactly what it is. So, I mean, if we knew it was going to happen, 
what would be the, if we knew it was going to happen, we'd do something else. That's exactly right. <laughs> we wouldn't even go forward. It's like going into the unknown. I mean, you just, you, that's where the courage is. You know, like Baba would say, you take it and then you hold on to the floor, you know, and then you enjoy, you enjoy <laughs> that journey, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it has, those five grams that I took 20 years ago changed the trajectory of my life. It really, really did, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I honor the fungi. Um, I don't take them as much as I used to because it was, you know, again, for 20 something years, you know, for 15 years straight, three, four, five times a year, I was taking the psychedelics, but I was getting to know myself and all the other selves that come along with me and the other selves that have been a part of me for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, mm -hmm. and once I got to blend that energy and get to know, I'm just real cool. I'm just like real cool. Yeah, it's not a whole lot that can rattle me. And especially the stuff that's going on right here. I lost my husband to this thing and I'm not afraid of what's going on out here. It was just his way out. And that's all there is to it. It was his way out of here, you know. Would I have preferred a damn piano to fall out the sky and smash him? Yeah, of course I would have. Instead of the notoriety of COVID-19, but it was his way out. And I understand that. Yeah. All right. That um makes me feel real tender to hear you talk like that. This oh. is kind of kind of hits me. Yeah. It's my man. It's my mm -hmm. man. Yeah. Well. Well, this has been like lovely. And I you know, really appreciate you taking the time on well, the on the new moon. On uh -huh. the new moon, yes. Um, set some intentions for this new moon. You know what? I think I have a, let me see. Do I have a, something to share? Uh, maybe not. While you're looking for it, in the Vedic tradition, this new moon is actually the, the new moon that we honor the ancestors. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, their prayers are so lovely because... You know, they talk about, you know, our ancestors and all of the people in, in, in that lineage and all of the people who were ever kind to those people and all the mm -hmm. people that they were kind to, all of the people who, you know, bestowed favors upon them, all the people who had best favors bestowed upon them, you know, all of their friends, all of the, all of the people that they were friends with and all of the people that they were in lineages with in their past lives. So it That's creates this beautiful. just net of blessings and appreciation. That is beautiful. And I feel that so deeply. Thank you for sharing that, mm -hmm. you know, that this new moon, and, yeah. and, you know, perhaps that's why, I mean, cause Kalindi has given me several messages throughout the day, you know, and of course, you know, I have my altars for the uh, family members, uh, mm -hmm. which is definitely a portal for them to kind of move through. You know, I keep my altar fed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I say that, I mean that, you know, uh, in, at Baba's altar, there are mushrooms there. You mm -hmm. know, my sister, she has cherries and um, money. <laughs> my other sister has a bottle of wine and my brother has a bowl of grits and my mama has a peppermint. So, you know, yeah, we my my wife bought donuts for her grandmother. Her grandmother yes. passed a couple months ago. She yes. got donuts. And, they, and when you feed your altars and you recognize and you hold them in high reverence, they will definitely give you the energy that you need and guide you. I mean, you could be driving down the street and you know you got to make a right turn to go where you got to go. But for whatever reason, you make a left and you're like, what the hell did I make that left for? Well, that's just your ancestor's way of saying, I don't need you to be in that place at that particular time. So I'm going to take you this way. And when you can feel the energy like that, the divine energy that comes through in dealing with that, that's a beautiful thing. So thank you for sharing that because I didn't know that this moon in particular, but I've just, I've been feeling something all day. I just got the chills several times, which lets me know that spirit is very near, you mm -hmm. know, and we do know, again, it's only been five months since I lost my husband, but my husband said to me, maybe even days maybe four or five days after his passing, the energy came through was Ayana. I don't need you to lay in this grief. Mm -hmm. I need you to get up, move about so that you can hear me because the less you grieve, the more you're going to hear me. 
And so I got up and I got that altar going and settled and I put his things on it. And I started to work on my heart and my loss and this human loss that I felt because I know that he was now not a part of the human suffering anymore, but an expanded, you know, he was no longer locked in this physical energy. He mm -hmm. was just out there. And that in itself is beautiful. So the ancestors do appreciate the reverence and they are here to help us. Yeah. And I mean, I know it's a lot, right? You know, it's like, I, I, I'm feeling it more and more as we're talking that, that it's a lot for you to be here. And I, I recognize that. And it's just my deep hope that like this moment, that this event gives you more than it takes. You know, that this is, that I really am hoping that we're nourishing you while you're here, that you can feel the love of the- I do feel the love. Hundred I, some odd people who are watching. I do feel, I, I do feel, and you know, I think I spoke to you uh, uh, through email, like how this whole virtual thing just kind of really turns me off because I like to, you know, the energy and to feel being such an empath, you just get the energy. But I do, Daniel, I do feel it. You know, you're such a wonderful moderator. You're the softness in your voice and the their body language. It just puts you right at ease and, um, I thank you. I'm very honored and I truly do thank you for this moment. So love to everyone. Yeah. Peace and magical blessings always. Peace and magical blessings. Any last thoughts that you want to leave us with or? Well, you know, again, my husband's words just resonate, which is to continue the work. We've got a lot of work to do you know, and connecting. We're looking for a particular set of people. And right now those people are the psychonauts, those that are brave enough to take the journey and connect the dots. We got a lot of healing to do on this planet. We are at war, you know, and the balance to be sought, you know, while we're taking care, nurturing and educating the children and the men are out fighting the beasts and slaying the dragons. And we bring that balance together and we make it work. We have to make it work men and women are not making it work anymore. We're enemies and it's all by design. Mm. So the beautiful fungi has come to this planet and it's been on this planet for eons, but it's here right now, very prevalent, very energetic, very powerful. More and more people are gathering in this name so that we can save what we need to save, which is humanity. and it's going to happen. I believe that in my heart. Um, so let's just keep it going. Let's just keep it going with events like this, you know, with the conference that we just had here in Detroit, 250 people plus showed up in the midst of all that's going on because we don't allow things to stop us. We are psychonauts for a reason. Gorgeous. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys so much. Thanks mm -hmm. to everybody that tapped in. Um, again, peace and magical blessings and nothing but love. Always. All right. Be well. I will see some of you tomorrow morning. We start at 7.45 a.m. with Darren LeBaron. Darren LeBaron, one of my favorite talks. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I love him completely. Thanks again. All right. Be well. Much love. Much love, too.